I'm Kento Bento. This video is brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. If you were put in charge of one mission, to take down the North Korean regime, a mission that had previously left world leaders beaten and befuddled, where failure could result in changes to the political and physical landscape for generations to come, what would you do? Oh, and time is of the essence here, as the longer you wait, the likelier it is for Dear Leader to complete development of nukes capable of reaching the continental US, or perhaps anywhere else in the world. Actually, according to some intelligence, we might already be too late. But whether North Korea actually fires is another question altogether. If we are to rid the world of this nefarious regime, I'm talking the regime, not the people, we have to consider the options. In this video, I'll go over the seven ways to take down North Korea, including the most destructive, the most convenient, the most secretive, and the most unexpected. We'll start with what seems the most popular choice. That's according to the YouTube comment section. We're talking the nuclear option. Those who are less informed about the situation might think, why not just... Let's indulge this. Currently, there are nine countries with nuclear capabilities, eight if we're considering the global threat of North Korea as the target. Keep in mind, this video isn't necessarily meant to be from the perspective of just one country. So let's first consider which of these countries could realistically take a nuke shot at the DPRK. Now, due to the diplomatic and or economic relations, India and more so Pakistan are extremely unlikely to attack North Korea. Of course, China and Russia are historic allies. The UK will likely wait for someone else to make the first move. France is all about sanctions. Israel doesn't even admit to having nukes. So this leaves us with, yes, predictably, the US as the only country that would and could realistically nuke the Hermit Kingdom, or so it seems. Currently, the US has an estimated arsenal of 6,800 nukes, just shy of Russia's 7,000. Together, these two countries make up 92% of the world's estimated 15,000 nuclear warheads. Compare that with North Korea's whopping 60 nukes, and perhaps you'll find yourself leaning towards this side of the fence. But it's not that simple. This is a nuclear bomb, a detonation of which could realistically be up to 80 times more powerful than Hiroshima. Millions of innocent lives would be lost, even more would be affected by radiation poisoning, the fallout would reach neighboring countries, and that's not even considering the case US intelligence gets it wrong, fails to destroy their nuclear capabilities, and North Korea is able to fire one off in a chaotic scramble. Now, if that were to happen, it's unlikely the nuclear warhead would ever reach US soil, but it's certainly not impossible. If North Korea were extremely lucky with their missile successfully crossing the Pacific Ocean, bypassing US missile defense systems, then yes, we'd be looking at a mushroom cloud over a US city. Things could get real messy real quick. So perhaps you'd be more inclined to go with the next method, assassination. Certainly a cleaner approach. No collateral, no mass devastation. You'd only be targeting one man, the chairman of the Workers' Party, the supreme leader of North Korea. Yes, the fashion icon himself, Kim Jong-un. Now to pull this off, however, is no easy task. In the US, the killing of foreign political officials is, shall we say, frowned upon. But even if you were to legally or illegally get past that, there's still the issue of proximity. North Korea is so close, it's virtually impossible for any outside intelligence service to isolate the supreme leader for a clandestine hit. Aside from the fact that getting into North Korea undetected is a challenge in itself, Kim Jong-un has been known to take extreme measures in ensuring his own safety and survival. He travels at dawn, changes venues and schedules on short notice, makes heavy use of decoy vehicles. He's so paranoid only a few family members ever know his whereabouts at any given moment. So you'd have to rule out the more traditional methods of assassination. That is, unless you are able to enlist the unlikely help of someone Kimmy considers a confidant who has private access to the dictator. Finding such an individual though is more contingent on luck. But let's say you're successful and Kim Jong-un meets his demise. Yes, it'll be a very sad day for hair enthusiasts around the world, but on top of that, it'll provide justification to those loyal to him to retaliate. Assassinating a head of state is the definition of an act of war. And whoever takes the reins after him, whether an elite member of the Workers' Party or yet another Kim family member, may want to demonstrate strength through retaliation. Thus, it may be that assassinating just Kim Jong-un isn't enough. That high-ranking officials, elites, certain family members all need to be collectively taken out and along with any retaliatory assets and nuclear arsenals. Assuming the case, you'd want to do this with minimal civilian casualties. How about then, an invasion? A military invasion? 
presumably one that's highly strategized, extremely well coordinated, hitting all the right targets at once with help from various nations. For this, you would first need to heavily bolster the amount of military assets within striking distance of North Korea. You need to build a large enough attack force that can overwhelm the enemy. There's a problem though. Such a massive military mobilization can't be hidden. North Korea would instantly know what's up. Kim Jong-un may be ridiculed in many parts of the world, but what he is, is a student of history. He paid attention when Saddam Hussein pretty much allowed the US-led coalition to build up their immense fighting force right on Iraq's doorstep. He knows that once the US and allied forces are in place, they will take out his weapons of mass destruction, move across the 38th parallel, and cripple his regime. The only chance he would have in this scenario is to strike first. We already know that a North Korean nuke is unlikely to hit the continental US, but that's not the case for South Korea and Japan. Before the allies can even spring into action, perhaps millions of people would have already perished. To avoid North Korean detection, you can try building your fighting force gradually, over a longer period of time, to avoid suspicion. It might work, and if it does, North Korea will undoubtedly be reeling. But even with a massive opening attack, it would be near impossible to take out all of North Korea's retaliatory assets. You see, North Koreans are diggers. They have tunnels all over the country, with their weapons and nuclear assets stored deep underground. This is to avoid international surveillance. This means intelligence agencies only have limited information, at best, with regards to where they should first strike. Say they do, and they miss their target or targets. Well, they would lose the element of surprise. Don't get me wrong, this should still be relatively decisive in favor of the US and her allies. But this could be the difference between a strategically unanimous victory and one of bittersweet. Because if North Korea gets a chance to retaliate, it's likely that at least the South Korean capital Seoul would be met with fire and fury. And that's not even considering a nuclear retaliation. With the bustling metropolitan city being only 35 miles from the Korean Peninsula's demilitarized zone, that's the DMZ border, it wouldn't take much for North Korean artillery to rain down on the capital. Chemical and biological weapons are also well within their arsenal, which makes the entire situation even scarier. Now, the Pentagon estimates war with North Korea to be a four to six month long conflict with high intensity combat and many dead, perhaps up to half a million US and South Korean military casualties within the first three months of fighting. That's crazy. Then there's also the aftermath to deal with. ISIS came about partly from a power vacuum left behind after the toppling of Saddam Hussein's regime, and a similar situation for Libya after Muammar Gaddafi was killed. History of the last 20 years tells us you need a very good plan for filling that vacuum left behind after a tyrant has been deposed. North Korea is no different. Rising from the ruin could be a threat far worse than even Kim Jong-un. Now speaking of something far worse, what if North Korea's allies decided to step in? There may be a few countries that come to mind, but the most prominent historic ally of North Korea is China. China is particularly adamant in maintaining North Korean stability due to the potential ramifications of a united Korea under US influence. This would strengthen US presence in the East, something China does not want. Also, should the entire Korean peninsula become one under the Republic of Korea, US military would be free to move the troops all the way up to the Chinese borders. There's also the humanitarian crisis to deal with. Should the DPRK collapse, millions of poverty-stricken North Koreans would force their way into the country, causing great social disruption to China. So you can understand China's perspective in all of this. Unfortunately, it just so happens to be North Korea's greatest defense against any and all foreign threats. What then if you could remove this layer of protection? What if you were able to somehow get China to completely stop its support of North Korea? Well, one thing's for sure, those economic sanctions that never seem to work, the likelihood just went up. They might actually start working. After all, China provides North Korea with most of its food and energy supplies. The Chinese North Korean trade accounts for more than 90% of the Hermit Kingdom's total trade volume. If China decided to call it quits, they're kind of screwed. In such a case, North Korea would either have to play ball with the international community or become even more self-reliant than they already are. This latter option wouldn't be sustainable though, as much of the North Korean population are already starving, living in squalid conditions. If things get worse, as you would inevitably expect from stricter sanctions, how much longer do you think Kim Jong-un would be able to stave off rebellion from his own people? Now, all this seems great and all, but why would the Chinese even help in the first place? What's in it for them? Well, you can try convincing them of the inevitable truth, and that is there's simply no way North Korea in its current form would last. 
the regime will fall, whether by external or internal forces. So when that day finally comes, guess what? China's still gonna have that refugee crisis. The US will still be able to prop their troops right up at the border, and all of China's fears would pretty much happen anyway. That is, unless everyone works together now, before it happens, to prepare for and shape a transition that's realistic and indeed taking China's interests into account as well. For the issue of refugees, perhaps an expansion into North Korea can be granted, acting as a sort of buffer zone, to more efficiently and effectively deal with the mass influx. For the separation of China and US, it can be agreed that US troops are not to leave the southern part of Korea. Point being, whatever middle ground is reached would be better than the alternative. Now, if you're wondering how realistic this all is, well, it mightn't actually be as far-fetched. There's already a mutual distrust growing between China and North Korea due to the regime's aggressive pursuit of nuclear weapons. They ain't happy about it either. And China has already enforced recently some pretty strict sanctions on North Korea. Perception of Kim Jong-un isn't exactly favorable among the Chinese public either, as noted by his given nickname, Kim Fatty III, or Jin San Pang. Despite all this, it isn't to say that simply aligning the Chinese would do the trick. The reason why none of the sanctions have worked thus far is because the matter is existential. Kim Fatty III, like all totalitarian leaders, wants above all to ensure his own survival. He's convinced that having the capability for a nuclear strike is necessary in deterring the United States and South Korea from threatening his regime. Therefore, quite possibly, no amount of economic sanctions, even with Chinese enforcement, would make a difference. He feels his life depends on the preservation of a regime, of a country. And the thing is, he's not irrational to think that. Both Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi gave up nuclear programs only to find themselves defenseless against foreign interventions that ultimately claim their lives. So by going the route of extreme sanctions, you may really only be hurting the North Korean people more than anything. And this is a heartbreaking reality. We all know that the last thing they need is for life to get even harder. Okay, we've already considered methods of war and bloodshed, of sanctions and contentious alliances. Perhaps what we need instead is a slicker approach. I'm talking a bit of covert action, and one that targets more so Kim Jong-un's rule rather than Kim Jong-un himself. The idea being that you set it all up, you set the scene for him to be replaced by someone who will actually engage rationally with the international community. But whether this new regime will lean more towards the influence of the West or that of, say, the Chinese, depends on which of these countries is the one successful in infiltrating the North Korean government. For the US, you can try recruiting North Koreans as double agents, but as previously noted, that's more contingent on luck. For South Korea, they surely have sympathizers in the North, but the veil of overt South Korean antagonism within North Korean society and in the government puts limitations on what they can accomplish. It's perhaps a lot more likely for China to succeed in this endeavor due to the long-standing diplomatic relations between the two countries. Yeah, there are recent tensions, but China still has contacts within the North Korean government, many of whom would prefer to see Kim ousted. Some say the purging and numerous executions of Pyongyang elites in recent years is in part due to Kim Jong-un's suspicions of a Chinese espionage plot intended to unseat him. These high-profile executions famously included his own uncle, Jang Song-tek, who had strong ties with the Chinese. Now, for decades, North Korea's propaganda had revolved around the Kim family's mystical claim to power. They are revered. So if you were to mount a coup, it might therefore be smart to have Kim's replacement be another Kim family member. There would be less resistance from the masses. Okay, but where exactly are you gonna find a Kim family member who's willing to overthrow his or her own blood? You run down the choices and they're all pretty unlikely, loyal to the current regime except one. Enter Kim Jong-nam, Kim Jong-un's half-brother, who was considered the heir apparent to his father at one point in time before being exiled. Some say Kim Jong-nam was actually being groomed by a foreign government to replace the current Kim. He had the revered Kim family name, but with no power base inside of North Korea, a perfect combo. It's speculated he was in Malaysia on February 13th, 2017 to meet with intelligence officials to discuss details of a regime change that he would apparently lead, at least in the eyes of the public. Unfortunately for Nam, Un had long been aware of his brother's utility as a potential pawn for his enemies and had sought to deal with it. Or so the story goes. Now, the legitimacy of the North Korean government has always depended on myths. Myths about the infallibility of its leaders, their victory in the Korean War, how much better it is to live in North Korea than in South Korea. What then if the North Korean people actually found out the truth? 
This is the second to last method, and it all comes down to the people having access to external information, which they currently don't have. North Korea is arguably the most closed and secretive nation on earth. Now, you may have heard though that things are gradually changing. This is true. Thanks to certain groups such as those who organize illegal border smuggling and airdropped information leaflets or DVDs, knowledge is spreading among the North Korean people. They're becoming more aware of the prosperity and freedom of their contemporaries down south and the abnormality of their own suffering. More fuel to the fire is how the people feel about the supreme leader's general lack of accomplishments and the culture of fear he propagates. I guess it's pretty tricky to run a reign of terror. If you don't kill enough people, you may be perceived as too weak. If you kill too many people, they'll think it's only a matter of time before you kill them too. It's a fine balance. Now, this is all good stuff if you want to incite instability, but you can add to it. Government funding can be increased to further support existing methods of information spread. Not just border smuggling and balloons, but things like helping fund defector-run radio stations and enlisting tech companies to find creative ways for North Koreans to safely share information. The hope is that one day, armed with knowledge and aspiration, the North Korean people would ask the question that East Germans asked in 1989, which was, why should we stay separated by minefields and guard towers from a vastly wealthier and freer version of ourselves. Once again, this is something Kim Jong-un and the regime are aware of and are ardently fighting this battle, but it's only a matter of time. As history has shown repeatedly, Stalin's Russia, Mao's China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, trying to isolate people from knowledge of the world is a feat that cannot be sustained. Just like the Arab Spring, it's likely that one day, one day, North Korea will see a revolution. Now, the last option isn't one that many people have heard of. There's no death or destruction, there's no deception or convoluted plots, and it might just be the most reliable yet creative method yet. You decide. It's the money bomb. No, this isn't a metaphor or a code name. It is really a money bomb. What this is, is the extensive bombing of North Korea with counterfeit versions of its own currency, which would be the North Korean one. What do I mean by this? Well, planes, drones, balloons would all rain down phony North Korean won like confetti over every city and commune. The events that follow would eventually lead to North Korea's demise. Okay, you're probably confused. Let me explain. What's gonna happen is that with the sudden excessive growth of money, everyone would be able to afford things. As such, price levels for goods and services would increase. In fact, this would be a rapid and continuous process. As time goes on, the North Korean won would lose more and more of its value, its purchasing power. This would cause panic. People would start ridding themselves of this rapidly devaluing local currency, you know, before it becomes even more worthless. They would quickly spend any money they receive, which in turn causes a further acceleration in prices. This creates an imbalance between the supply and demand of the money. I hope you're following me. At some point, the North Korean won would essentially become worthless, and the entire population would be forced to use more stable currencies like the US dollar, the Chinese yuan, and the euro. You see, the value of economic items remains relatively stable for these foreign currencies. The country will have no choice now but to accept its widespread use, whether legally or otherwise. As a result of this, North Korea would become dependent on foreign banks and foreign trade more than ever before. And this is leverage that the outside world can use against them. Because, well, what's the most important thing to Kim Jong-un? His weapons, his weapons of mass destruction, because it ensures his survival. Now he's not gonna be able to pay for the missile parts and bomb making technology with his own currency. It now has to be with foreign currency. So he's gonna have to earn foreign currency to pay for all of it. And not to mention the dollars and yuan he would need to pay his own people to stave off rebellion and worker strikes. Currently, North Korea generates these hard currencies from a few sources around the world. The idea is that these can be targeted and potentially eliminated. So North Korea's international business model includes slave labor, trafficking of drugs, trafficking of counterfeit goods, the sale of coal and timber, the sale of weapons, interest payments from Chinese banks, and get this, cyber attacks where they siphon funds from foreign banks. So sneaky. Most of these can be heavily restricted if not eliminated through sanctions and other such methods. Now, once their funds dry out, it's pretty much game over. Kim Jong-un would not be able to sustain his reign of terror. He would lose control 
over the country and even over the party elites. The wealthy and powerful would be frantically shifting their money, their savings, into foreign currencies and into overseas accounts. These funds would then be susceptible to sanctions. Support among the elites would fade, he would have less and less to offer them, he would lose that leverage he so desperately needs to stay in power, the ensuing financial panic would paralyze political decision making, the development of nukes and other weapons of mass destruction would be put on ice, Kim Jong-un would likely be dethroned, and all this, all of this, would be thanks to a wonderfully executed plan, a plan that started with the money bomb. Oh, and if that doesn't work, heck, if none of these seven methods work, there's still one thing that might take out Kim Jong-un. You can say it's the same thing that took out both his father and grandfather before him. Their lavish lifestyles. I hope you enjoyed this topic. You know, I took so long with this video, I was actually worried that by the time I had published it, North Korea would have been liberated and this video would have been redundant. Anyway, I have to give a huge shout out to Goldberry Bombadil, Bruce from Melbourne, and all the patrons who have supported us on Patreon. If you want to support us too, the link's in the description below. We really appreciate it. All right, thanks for watching, hit that like button, and for more Asian-y videos, don't forget to subscribe.